You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 30, 2013, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Hyper-IgE Syndrome. Our presenter is Laura Becker. She's a medical student at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. Um, our first presentation will be given by Dr. It's actually by Laura Becker. Uh, Laura, Laura is a second-year medical student. She'll soon be a doctor, but not, not yet, but soon. Uh, um, Laura Becker is a second-year medical student. Uh, she's been spending the month here uh, on the allergy service rotating with us. Uh, and uh, she's decided to give a presentation about hyper-IgE syndrome. So welcome to Conferences Online Allergy, uh, uh, Ms. Becker. Here's the uh, keyboard. Mouse, kind of have a mouse. So let me pull up your slides. It's right there, and uh, there you go. Get away. Here's the microphone. How do I switch the slides? Use the arrows. Okay. You can go up and down. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So it's just a quick overview of IgE or hyper IgE syndrome. We saw a patient that may have had it, but I don't think ended up having it. So there we go. So for objectives, it's just, like I said, a quick overview of the characteristics, the cause, treatment, um, testing methods, and diagnostic tools. So as for description, it's an autosomal dominant phagocytic disorder with impaired neutrophil chemotaxis. It's an immunodeficiency with recurrent staph infections and cold abscesses with little inflammatory response. Um, it's also known as Job syndrome or Job Buckley syndrome, which is related to the biblical character and the sore boils he got all over his body. I thought it was Dr. Job, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Biblical Job. Okay. Right. So uh, patients usually present with um, recurrent cutaneous and sinal pulmonary infections and chronic cutaneous and oral inflammation. They have recurrent skin uh, boils that manifest in the first few years of life, as well as uh, recurrent pneumonias with staph aureus, pneum uh, strep pneumonia, and haemophilus influenza. The common complications are uh, bronchiectasis, bronchopleural fistula, and pneumatoceles. The infections associated with hyper-IgE syndrome are contrast those with chronic granulomatous disease where the staph infections are all over versus just in the skin and lungs. On history, there are many warning signs um, that can point to a possible hyper-IgE syndrome patient, such as greater than four ear infections per year, greater than two sinus infections per year, greater than two months of oral antibiotics with little effect, Greater than two episodes of pneumonia, failure to thrive, the deep um, abscesses that are common in these patients, persistent thrush and fungal infections, need for intravenous uh, antibiotics, and family history of primary immunodeficiency. Uh, besides the characteristic features like the sinopulmonary and cutaneous infections, patients have other um, signs on physical exam. In the, for the immunological features, it's a pruritic crusty papula pustula rash similar to eczema that begins on the face and scalp and spreads to the trunk. And it generally, but these patients generally lack other allergic symptoms, unlike the eczema patients. They also have skin abscesses, deep-seated abscesses, a newborn rash, um, pneumonia, sinusitis, otitis media, mucocutaneous candidiasis, and the staph infections usually remain on the skin and, and the lung. They can also have opportunistic infections like disseminated histoplasmosis and cryptococcus. And as for the non-immune features of hyper-IgE syndrome, they generally retain their primary teeth. Um, they have scoliosis, a lot of musculoskeletal symptoms with uh, hyperextensible joints, bone fractures from very minimal trauma, osteopenia, um, and very characteristic facial features like deep-set eyes, a broad nasal bridge, um, a wide, fleshy nasal tip, and prominent skin pores. There are also uh, vascular abnormalities that are common in hyper-IgE patients like aneurysms that can have clinical sequelae, like um, MIs and subarachnoid hemorrhage. And the GI symptoms are present in almost 50% of patients, which manifests as GERD and dysphagia. And upper endoscopy frequently shows eosinophilic esophagitis. These patients generally survive into adulthood with just a little bit of a shortened lifespan. And death is commonly caused by gram-negative or filamentous fungal-like pneumonias that infect the damaged parenchyma in the lungs. As for the cause, it's thought to be a mutation in the STAT3 gene. I had a very differing, um, when it came to the genetics, there were very differing thoughts on 
penetrance and intrafamilial variability, but most of all it said the intrafamilial variability was minimal and the penetrance is incomplete. Um, anticip anticipation has not been observed and there's no known association with gender, ethnic, or racial groups. And the prevalence of the disease is not unknown as well. Diagnosis is made through a combination of tools like testing, genetic testing, and the clinical scoring system. The clinical scoring system was developed by the NIH um, and includes both immunologic and infectious manifestations as well as skeletal and connective tissue abnormalities. And this is just, it's hard to read, but it's a picture of their scoring system and it's pretty elaborate. Um, it, it was first created when they recognized hyper IgE syndrome as a multi-system disorder. And uh, it looks at factors like their skin abscesses, pneumonia, eczema, candidiasis, their char characteristic facies, uh, blood work, just really anything that was associated with these patients. If they score greater than a 40, it's highly su or it's suggestive of the autoimmune, autoimmune dominant, I cannot say it, autosomal dominant hyper IgE syndrome, thank you. And um, if it's 20 to 40, it's considered indeterminate and less than 20 is unlikely. Testing can uh, rule in or rule out diagnosis. The IgE levels are typically over 2,000, but they can be in the tens of um, thousands. There's a high eosinophil count, and chest imaging and bone density can help as well. Um, as for the Th17 cells, its uh, susceptibility to infection is thought to be due to a Th17 functional defect, which um, these cells help stimulate the production of anti-staphylococcal uh, factors. And on differential diagnosis, there are multiple diseases to look at, like severe atopic dermatitis. Uh, these patients present with elevated IgE and eosinophilia as well, but not the other aspects of hyper IgE syndrome, like the characteristic facies. Also, the atopic dermatitis patients have other allergy symptoms present typically. As for the autosomal recessive hyper IgE patients, um, they have an increased incidence of neurological abnormalities and increased incidence or occurrence of viral infections and they don't have the non-immunological features of autosomal dominant uh, hyper-IG syndrome. As for wiscat aldrich syndrome, um, they have the eczema and recurrent infections, but they also have thrombocytopenia and high incidence of autoimmune disease and lymphoma, and they, these patients generally have more opportunistic infections. It's also usually only seen in males due to its X-linked inheritance. Um, as for the Netherton uh, syndrome, it's an autosomal recessive syndrome with elevated IgE and rash, and they frequently have an enteropathy and failure to thrive. And as for Omen syndrome, they have a new, the newborn rash um, and elevated IgE, but these patients are generally sicker with associated lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, and opportunistic infection. Now, as for treatment, it's really based on preventing the infections and controlling symptoms. Prophylactic antibiotics target the Staph aureus and other pyogenic uh, bacteria to prevent pneumonias. The H1 antagonists help control the pruritus with the eczema, and it also is noted you could do the diluted bleach baths in chlorinated pools. Um, in the continued use of antifungals help control mucocutaneous candidiasis and prevent pulmonary disease. And as for the non-immunological non aspects, there's no known treatment really. They yeah, say the calcium. Oh. Go ahead. Oh. Uh, calcium and vitamin D can help with osteopenia and minimal trauma fractures. Maintaining a good blood, uh, blood pressure can help with the vascular disorders, and use of antiplatelets or anticoagulation therapies could be considered to prevent MI, but you have to weigh the risk of uh, hemoptysis. And that's really my complete overview. I just listed my references of where I found everything. Very good. It's a, it's a common you know, conundrum, we see a lot of patients who have really bad eczema, and their IgEs often are really high, and so physicians are constantly sending them in and asking us, is this hyper IgE syndrome? Because, of course, the name of the syndrome implies if you have high IgE, then you, you have it, and there's so many people who have that who don't have hyper IgE syndrome. And we, we, don't, do we, we don't really have a, a real standardized approach to confirming or ruling out this diagnosis, do we? Well, there's the, I don't, sorry if I missed it, but did you show the NIE? Yeah. The yeah, covering it's criteria. System, but it looks so complicated. Is it really? It's actually, it's actually pretty simple. It's pretty simple because it looks. A lot of it is just history, which you would take, and then if you have some labs, you put in at a score, and if the score is above a certain thing, then you can pursue genetic diagnosis. If not, you tell them, don't worry about it. I was wondering if we shouldn't have like a scoring sheet 
Maybe we could, we could nominate and keep it in the Actually, maybe even put it as a template into our electronic yeah. medical record so that if somebody has a suspected hyper IgE, you just pull up that template and then fill it in what the score is, is, and then you've got documentation that you looked at it. I know I worked in a few It's hard to remember so. what to ask, yeah. and it's hard to have to go to the literature and pull up this thing every time somebody comes Well, the simple ones, JR, if the child has had no spontaneous fractures, and the shedding of the teeth are normal, pretty much don't have upper IgE. So they always... They have always delayed shedding of primary teeth. They have, they have delayed shedding of primary teeth, so that would be one thing, and then they tend to have fractures and stuff like that a lot. The real obvious hyper IgE. Yeah. And then they have... You never see the real obvious anything. It's always sort of the in-between uncertainty. No, you, you, I mean, I actually have seen, so it's, you, and oh, okay. they have these abscesses. Uh -huh. which are really bad, not like the MRSA abscesses, but really. So they, they, you'll find it's a really severe eczema kid. I mean, in that kid, it's worthwhile going through this when you can't differentiate. But the moderate, mild eczema kids, they're not hyper IgE. Mm. And the face is a, if you see an abnormal face sees, then there's an abnormal face sees. I know in some sense you can't tell. <laughs> but they have a very coarse look. Seems like you have to say all coarse faces, and then you look and have people. I know. We all have syndrome. And it's hard to ask the mother if you think it's coarse because you said, you, you know, I said, you don't look like mother or father. You know, sometimes the child is like that. It's a common cause of funny looking kids, <laughs> funny looking parents. I know. It's, that's why this is helpful though, so I think it's a good uh, practice to go through this when you can. When would you do a STAT3 gene sequence? Looking only, at the mutations? only when the criteria mean it. If they are greater than 40, then, then you send it? And if you're not sure, 20 to 40, you could. 20 to 40, you could. Just yeah. Less than 20, don't bother. Don't bother. Hmm. If you want to see back in clinic in a year, you could, but don't bother to send is what I would say. Wow. Okay. Wow. Any other questions or comments? Oh, yeah, very, very good. But it is a tricky situation. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. See you next time.